Di diagnosing uh, sweat gland carcinomas can be quite challenging, uh, even, even in a regular dermatopathology laboratory. Uh, and this is largely because they're so rare. Uh, I've tried to think how many sweat gland carcinomas I would, would have seen in a, an annual year when I was working at St. John's and later at Brigham and Women. And I don't think I see more than about a dozen cases in any year. Uh, I probably get more as consultations, but uh, that would be it. And that frequency really was because we were a tertiary referral hospital, which obviously uh, means you see more cases. And um, so a lot of them are pretty tricky to diagnose, but some of them, like adenoid cystic, are instantly recognizable, provided you've seen one before. Now, one of the issues with sweat gland tumors is that uh, you may get similar lesions arising in visceral sites and so sometimes it's a problem uh, making sure you're not looking at a, at a metastasis rather than a primary skin tumor. And then an, another issue is um, many, many tumors can have all sorts of histological subtypes and if you don't know the subtypes, then you might be misled if the more usual features are not evident. And then uh, the other problem is getting information from the literature, which is really important when you want to study these tumors carefully. And this is, um, this is largely because of, well, I, I suppose inaccurate literature from the past where people have not really been talking about the same thing and so you get all these reports that contradict each other uh, and so on. And the other issue is uh, people are forever renaming tumours and so if you don't know all the names of a tumour you might not pick up all the literature. But fortunately for us and for this video, um, adenoid cystic is is a pretty easy diagnosis to make. Now, um, my, in my experience, these tumors arise on the face and scalp of the elderly, but you can get them at other sites, uh, particularly the chest and, and the abdomen, but you may get them uh, uh, more distally. And one of the important features of adenoid cystic is it tends to grow down nerves. I don't know whether it grows down nerves in a hundred percent of cases or not, but it's 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 um it's very common, and when you're looking at the histology of a case, it's terribly important that you look awfully carefully to check whether there's perineural or even intraneural extension, because that 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 accounts for the frequency of metastases that one encounters in these cases and it also accounts for the symptoms of pain and tingling and uh, that that you sometimes get um, metastases are really exceptional uh, and on the right i've copied two photographs from a, an article uh, by dr singh in which uh, the patient presented with a, a, an adenoid cystic carcinoma of the upper lip, which then spread to involve the, uh, the subpleural location in the lungs. Uh, but that's desperately rare. I've, uh, I think I've seen, I, I don't know, uh, a few cases where there were, were metastases, and the ones I've seen, I think, uh, predominantly affected lymph nodes, bone marrow, and lung. And here are two pictures I got on the, from the literature, uh, and this on the left is adenoid cystic carcinoma affecting the chest, and on the right presenting as a nodule on, on uh, hair-bearing chest skin. 
Um, and this is an interesting uh, couple of photographs I got from an article uh, by Dr. Armstrong, and the patient had a primary adenoid cystic carcinoma of the palate and developed metastases in the scalp. And that's very, very, uh, a very dramatic picture. Now, as I mentioned to you, adenoid cystic carcinoma is a very recognizable tumor. As soon as you've seen one, you've seen them all because they, they're all pretty much the same. And the critical feature is the presence of cribriform nests. And in this image on the top right, which was shared with me by Dr. by Professor Matthias Bobos from Thessaloniki in Greece, much of the image shows this uh, net-like cribriform growth pattern. And in the top right, you can see a solid nest, uh, which is sometimes a feature of adenoid cystic. And when you, it's composed mostly of solid nodules, the diagnosis gets a bit more difficult. Uh, the middle image is a diastase PAS to show that the uh, the mucin in the in the lumen of the of both the ducts and the pseudocysts uh, is is composed of epithelial mucin, so it's diastase PAS positive. Now, if you were wondering in, in any one instance whether a lesion was adenoid cystic or adenoid BCC, adenoid BCC is diastase PAS negative. So that makes uh, a very quick way of determining that differential diagnosis. Uh, the uh, immunohistochemistry, I've made a, a little point there. It's not something that I personally really ever used very, have used very much because it's such a recognizable tumor in the first place. Um, if you are stuck and you're still worrying about ad adenoid BCC, uh, look for myoepithelial cells because they are an invariable feature of um, adenoid cystic carcinoma. And very often, uh, these tumors show basement membrane reduplication. I'll show you a lovely example later. And that that's, uh, uh, can be highlighted with laminin and type 4 collagen. I suppose I should mention that MYB is, is, uh, is, is, is present in about 60% of cutaneous lesions, and this is reflecting the T69 translocation. So this is, I think this was the first adenoid cystic carcinoma that I ever saw, and there's a great big hair, and this lesion developed on the uh, scalp. And you can see a, uh, it's obviously a carcinoma. Uh, it's mostly uh, formed of tubules, but here and there, for example, in the middle of the field and on the left-hand side, one can get the sense of a cribriform growth pattern. And there's a, a close-up or a closer view and uh, you can see tubules and uh, this is this you know a, an ill-defined cribriform pattern I'll show you better in a moment in this field for example the cribriform growth pattern is very well developed and you see that the lumina uh, contain eosinophilic granular material and I mentioned this is a biphasic tumor. In this field, I put some arrows to highlight, highlight the myoepithelial cells. You'll, you'll notice that um, the nuclei are very bland. They're hypochromatic, but they're all the same shape and size. And that's typical of adenoid cystic. And the other thing is you don't get too many mitoses either. And there's a close-up view of the uh, of the uh, cribriform growth pattern. 
and I mentioned perineural infiltration, uh, and this is a this field shows that in the center, and uh, this is desperately important. You've really got to look very carefully at any one case to make sure that you pick it up if it's present. Sometimes you get deposition of this hyaline material. Uh, in an adenoid cystic, and that's due to deposition of basement membrane material. And here we see lovely cribriform growth pattern with lots of, of mucin in the, in the cystic spaces. And here in the center, we've got both perineural and intraneural spread. And this image comes from that same case that uh, Matthias shared shared with me and uh, I put this one in there's the there's that lovely uh, cribriform growth pattern uh, and below uh, is pretty much the same area in which I, I think I used uh, type 4 collagen to, to demonstrate the basement membrane reduplication and on the right just to remind you about diastase PAS. And here, this is from Matthias's case. You can see the myoepithelial cells nicely demonstrated by P63. PCEA shows you the, the uh, true ductal and uh, glandular spaces. And the bottom right, isn't that such a gorgeous picture? This is type 4 collagen. That's the best I've ever seen in an adenoid cystic. It's just absolutely stunning. And on the top, uh, adenoid cystic commonly expresses CD117 or C-kit. And this is another one uh, presented by Professor Chi Shun Yang from Taiwan. I included it just to highlight the myoepithelial cells. And this is a case that Ed, Eduardo Colongi shared, shared with me. And I just included it so that uh, when you finish watching this video, you'll have seen a whole bunch of cases. It's very typical, uh, beautiful cribriform growth pattern with a close-up view there. That's absolutely gorgeous. And you can see there's a retraction artifact here. Uh, so I can see why you might say, well, why isn't this um, an adenoid BCC? And the answer, of course, is uh, look for myoepithelial cells, which you can't see in this particular field, and do a diastase PAS. I'm trying. Yeah, in this in this uh, field from the, the tumor here, you can see myoepithelial cells. Uh, just arrowed nicely at the top of the field. More, more of the same. Here you can see this basement membrane uh, is forming little, little um, uh, nodules, uh, and uh, they would be positive with type four collagen or laminin. And uh, as you'd expect, uh, perineural infiltration. And then this case was shared with us by Michael Cardis from Kiko.com. And I included it because what I wanted you to be able to do when we finish this talk is for you to be comfortable that you can recognize adenoid cystic uh, at low power magnification. And when you look at this tumor, you can see towards the top uh, the most beautiful um, cribriform growth pattern. It's also present towards the base there, and this is the same tumor from a different, a different piece of tissue. And uh, the cribriform growth pattern is not really evident, but you can see the intra uh, luminal uh, sec secretions. And there we have a higher power view showing a lovely. Uh, cribriform growth pattern. So you don't need any special stains, you don't need any immunohistochemistry, you look at that, 
There's only the only thing that should cross your mind truthfully is is this primary in the skin? Is it growing into the skin from a salivary gland tumor? Or could it be a metastasis from somewhere else? And uh, this is a nice one that Antonina Kalmakova from uh, Kiev shared. On the left, typical adenocystic carcinoma, lots of basement membrane material being deposited. But on the right, it's more solid. And this solid variant sometimes causes diagnostic confusion until you find more typical features somewhere else in the tumor. And then lastly, I wanted to show this case. That, that this is a sort of a, cur a curiosity that Antonina shared with me some years ago. And it's a collision tumor. It's uh, adenocystic carcinoma on the left and Merkel cell tumor on the right, which is which has been described. There are two or three cases in the literature, but I think it's just a just a coincidence. I don't really see how one can relate them. There's the adenoid cystic. There's the Merkel cell. A close up of the adenoid cystic, and there you see very well developed cribriform growth pattern in multiple areas of that image. So I don't think we have any doubts about the the adenoid cystic. There's a close-up view there. And here you can see the myoepithelial cells uh, confirming that it's a biphasic tumor. I think uh, our Antonina put that annotation in. I don't know why she did, but I, uh, I put it in just to make her happy and this is the, this is the Merkel cell but as you see there small basophilic cells very uniform my two C's are all over the place this thing is teeming with them uh, I've just moved my cursor around and everywhere you look there are my two C's just everywhere dozens of them there's another one there another one there not an abnormal one there so i don't think there's any doubt about that and uh there's another close-up view showing the same thing uh now this this tumor this is a, a blood vessel cut in, in a, a, an oblique fashion and it looks as if the tumor is growing into the blood vessel wall and this is a different cut of the same vessel and it shows you adenoid cyst or a Merkel cell tumor growing down the lumen of, of a vessel. So I don't think that bodes very well. Um, the adenoid cystic bit was CK20 negative, but it's CK7 positive, which you'd expect. And there, P63 showing the myoepithelial cells. And then the Merkel cell component was very strongly CK56 positive. And there were one or two areas with very, very focal CK20 expression, but very, un, very unimpressive. And then lastly, just the differential diagnosis. And I've mentioned systemic adenoid cystic and uh, adenoid cystic growing from a salivary gland. I think the only real differential is adenoid BCC, which is you're seeing on the right hand side with the adenoid bit at the top and a, a micronodular BCC at the bottom. And, uh, and I've mentioned the contents of the uh, uh, cystic areas in BCC are Alcium blue positive, diastase PAS negative, and BCC does not show a myoepithelial cell component. I'm going to talk later in different videos about secretory carcinoma, cribriform carcinoma, and spiradenocarcinoma. So I hope that's been of some use to you, particularly the uh, first year residents. And if you have any comments, please, please do tell me and I'll see if I can answer any questions. Thank you very much.